Have you ever found yourself in this kind of situation? You're going out to a party and you determine in your own mind you are going to concentrate on making everybody else happy at that party. You're really going to concentrate on ensuring that your wife, your friends enjoy themselves. And one of the ways you can do that, of course, is to show an interest in them. You know fine well that People like to think that other people are interested in them. And one of the ways to show that interest is to allow them to talk about themselves and to talk about their experiences and to crack good jokes at which you laugh and show appreciation. And so you determine, I am going to do that. This party, I am not going to make a whole show of myself. I'm going to concentrate on making my friends and my wife and my dear ones happy. And so you uh, get into the car and you drive to the home where the party is and you go in and you begin to talk and you have some refreshments and you get into conversation and the jokes fly back and forward and the experiences fly back and forward. And then suddenly you find yourself pushing your own so experiences and your own jokes forward. And you find yourself drawing attention to you in the midst of the conversation. And before you know it, you're trying to better the other person's joke. And you're subtly trying to turn the conversation round to the things that you're good at and that you're interested in. And in a matter of half an hour or so, you have everybody listening to you and concentrating on your life. And suddenly you catch somebody's eye and you see that glazed look as they listen to yet another one of your stories and you stop talking because you realize that all your great resolutions about making everybody else important and treating everybody else as the center of attention have been overthrown by something inside you that you cannot understand. Have you ever had that kind of experience where you determined that you would make everybody else the center of conversation and yet before the evening was through, you had ended up drawing people in all your conceit and your pride to attending to you and making a great deal of you and making you feel you were the important one. And you realize that there's something inside you that you cannot control. There's some part of you that almost like a disease draws attention to itself. It's something that you don't seem able to restrain. It's a part of you that is just determined to make itself the center of attention. There's something in you that wants other people to give their attention to you, even if you have resolved to give your attention to them. It's some part of you that seems almost alien to you. It almost seems like another person inside yourself that you actually are not able to control. And yet it does the job again and again. So most of us have discovered that there are these two drives inside us. One drive is a kind of generous, unselfish drive that makes us want to give other people our attention and make them the center of conversation. And inside us, there is a, a yet stronger drive that works despite ourselves to draw attention to us and to make us the center of conversation. What we have been discussing on this broadcast each day for some months now is the explanation of that, almost that Jekyll and Hyde personality that you have. That nice, loving side of you that you yourself espouse, and then that ugly, uh, monstrous side of you inside that seems to be the one that really rules your life. And we've been talking about how it connects up, actually, with the explanation of reality. Because we've been talking about the fact that there is obviously a creator because of the order and design that you see in the universe and the amazing 
phenomena like the chart of the elements where those of you who know a little about science remember how the elements just fit into that periodic chart beautifully in a way that only an intellectual mind could create and design. And we've looked at the way the seasons run and the way they come regularly year after year. We've looked at the regular orbiting of the planets and the stars. And we've come to the conclusion that there has to be a personal intellect behind this universe that we live in. And we've said a personal intellect because he must be at least as personable as we are in order to design us persons. And then you remember we talked about whether that creator had ever shown himself here on our earth. And then we discussed the amazing character that lived 1900 years ago, absolutely different from Muhammad and from Zoroaster and from Confucius and from all the great so-called religious leaders that we have seen, because this man said that he was the son of the maker of the universe. And he actually lived like that. He lived a perfect life had power over nature, had power over sin, was the only man that even his enemies said had done nothing evil. And this man was, of course, the man that we know as Jesus of Nazareth. And among other things, he described to us how our father, his father, our creator, is actually one who loves us and who loves you and actually is your father. And uh, that your own earthly father is only a shadow of that real father that you have. And that your creator made you and made me so that we would live our lives out in daily trust in him. That is treating him as a real friend. Just looking to him for the things that we needed, especially for guidance and what we should think in certain situations, and to trust him that if we did what he had put us here to do properly, then he would supply all our needs for us, sometimes through our wages, sometimes through our salary, sometimes through the way he controlled our cash flows, sometimes by mysterious means that we ourselves would not understand. But uh, the important thing that Jesus explained to us was that this creator had numbered even the hairs of your head. That's how important you are to him. He has counted even the hairs of your head. And that you actually get your sense of self-esteem and self-worth from his attitude to you. But of course, Jesus explained that we have given up that stuff as old-fashioned and we've decided we'll do without his love. And so there has appeared in our lives a great vacuum, a great emptiness, because we lack his love. And so we have to substitute what we can for that love. And one of the qualities that that love gave us, of course, was this great self-esteem and self-worth, this sense of identity and sense of value. And when we turned against this whole idea of depending on his love, of course, we lack that self-esteem. And what we have tried to do is to get it from other people. And that has, in turn, contorted and perverted our whole personalities, so that we now have personalities that are absolutely dependent on the praise of other people and the approval of other people. That's why you end up drawing attention to yourself at a party at which you have determined you will give attention to other people. It's because your very personality and nature has been perverted and twisted through the years so that it is no longer what our Creator made it. And so the reason you do that, the reason you end up making yourself the important person in the midst of conversations and parties is because your own personality, your own nature, has become perverted, not only through the years that you have lived, but actually through the years that your grandparents, your great-grandparents, and all your forefathers have lived. And that nature, this man Jesus called an old nature. It was our old nature. It wasn't the nature that we were made with. It is an old nature that we have produced by our own actions and the actions of our forefathers down through the years. That's the thing that prevents you being what you want to be. Let's talk a little more about some of the other effects of that old nature and how to escape from it tomorrow at this same time.